Hi, I'm George Bullendorf, Marketing Manager at Empower RF Systems. The next 30 minutes I'll be discussing the subject of a modern solid state power amplifier architecture for very high power applications. And we'll also be getting some interesting commentary by our CTO Palo Korea along the way. Now think about this. The architecture of power amplifiers hasn't changed in over 30 years since the introduction of the microcontroller for system control and reporting. Look around you. The advancements of your phone, not just the hardware on your phone, but the whole infrastructure. The TV has completely gone digital. Your car, electrical steering, you're not even mechanically connected to the wheels. And even currency has gone digital. Now, look at all the test equipment in your lab. Look at the advancements there. Most of it's gone digital, but not the amplifiers. Now look at the calibration stickers. Why is it the amplifier is the only piece of test equipment in your lab without one? There is no question that has to change, but when? And for that matter, what is the right architecture of the future? Well, granted it's subjective and certainly dependent on the application. For example, the best amplifier architecture is not the same for cellular tower-mounted amplifiers as it is for FAA radar. Who is the right architecture of the future for? It's for big power applications, domination of the electromagnetic battle space, multifunction radar and other complex waveform handling applications, TWT replacement in an aging infrastructure needing significant total cost of ownership and mean time to repair improvements, and SATCOM for higher availability and higher data rates. These are some example applications starving for a more capable solid state power amplifier solution Put simply, is the need for more effective use of the amplifier, not just in RF performance, but features that enhance end-use application capabilities. In a moment, I'm going to give you a visual of the system, but notice contemporary solid-state PA designs have not taken advantage of the newest technologies. High-speed A to Ds and D to A converters, fiber optics, RF silicon integrated into FPGA fabric, and digital signal processing. But going digital is required for significant improvements in most of the categories shown here. Reliability and availability, fidelity, waveform flexibility, long pulse width and duty cycles, scalability, precise control with short latencies, accurate complex waveform power management, faster frequency hopping, and broader instantaneous detection bandwidth. Here's the visual of the system, a scalable liquid cooled amplifier. The implementations are usually broadband in CW or Pulse. It's uh, liquid cooled for power density reasons, for example, an equivalent air cooled system would be two and a half times larger. The amplifier system consists of a controller and a 3U form factor. There are 16 modular amplifier building blocks that are 2U in size and are fully integrated amplifiers in their own right. Uh, rounding out the major elements of the six foot tall chassis is the liquid cooling distribution system shown on the right. There's a 16 to 1 combiner that's integral to the rack, but stay tuned, not shown here, but detailed later. That lower left image is the backplane where each of the 16 modular 2U amplifier drawers slide in and out, blind mated to the rest of the system. And I should mention, not shown here, is the external pump system and heat exchanger uh, for the sake of brevity. The foundation of the scalable amplifier is the 2U liquid-cooled PA building block. Each 2U chassis is a fully functioning integrated amplifier, full gain, no external driver with power supplies. Separate system level power supplies not required. And I'll go into more detail, intimate detail on that 2U building block here shortly. The backplane connections and mechanical interface design ensure dripless liquid cooling and hot swap capability of the individual 2U amplifier drawers. The transmitter does not have to be taken offline to service or replace individual amplifiers. The output power waveguide combiner inside a cabinet is configured based on frequency and number of 2U boosters in a given transmitter cabinet. In other words, you don't have to be fully populated with, with 16. It can be 8, 12, 14, for example. The combiner design includes directional couplers with forward and reverse sample ports. Here is the 2U RF drawer with its one driving four in parallel configuration. The 4 to 1 waveguide combiner terminates in a blind mate connector. Amplitude and phase is controlled digitally on board. The power supplies are on the underside and the liquid cooling ports are a proven dripless technology. 
Let's talk about points of failure. Availability is much higher than TWT. The TWT tube, power supply, and tube driver stage are single points of failure on TWT amplifiers. And traditional solid state designs also have several points of fail failure, crudely solved in some cases with a redundant system and baseball switch. This one driving four arrangement, if a pallet goes down, the one driving three section continues to operate with the output power dropping fractionally. If a driver fails, the 2U drawer fails. In either case, an equivalent fractional loss in output power occurs and the system remains on air. Alarm and notifications are present while the amplifier maintains output transmission at a reduced level. However, the control system maximizes available output power. Pulling this off is not trivial. High-speed data and control requires a 9.6 gigabit per second data stream between the amplifier drawer and the system controller. So tell, tell us about the fiber optic capability inside the unit. Yes, one of the things that we thought is that we are putting up to 10 kilowatts in a 2U chassis, which is a very high power. Okay, and what we are doing, what we were concerned is that when you wire that back to the back of the unit, where it's going to plug into the uh, back planes and the combiners and the splitter, that this could be um, could cause some uh, some kind of uh, EMI problem. So we have a patent on this where we put all the sensors and uh, and uh, uh, variables and uh, Ethernet and uh, serial port. All that is packed together in a fiber optic and sent to the back of the unit. So and uh, is decoded in the in, in the back of in the rear panel of the unit allowing us to have a very, just one fiber instead of a bunch of wires. Okay, uh, it's a simple reduction on labor cost and uh, extremely well uh, suitable for the level of power that we have inside the amplifier and avoid, and therefore avoiding EMI, EMC problems. It is a patent technology and uh, we are very proud to have that in our systems. I teased earlier the amplifier's lack of digital sophistication. The contemporary amplifier is an open loop design. It has limiter functions for peak power, visoire, thermal, but it's an open loop design with the responsibility of closing the loop left to the system integrator. That external loop is slow and limits operational capabilities. From a software architecture perspective, it's helpful to think of the goal being to take traditional external functionality and control and put it inside the amplifier. A couple obvious examples, uh, output power control without using external metering, and digital filtering eliminating costly external high power filters. Less obvious is eliminating the need to generate cal factors through self calibration. Pulse response is another interesting problem. The system integrator will improve the amplifier's pulse response by creating a custom exciter wave shape by digitizing the output pulse, adding in the inverse function to the original exciter waveform with digital post processing, not in real time. Pulse shaping is a capability we have demonstrated. The real-time signal processing aspect is a core dimension of the modern architecture and a huge subject to cover, a good topic to detail in a future presentation. Can, uh, can you tell I me mean, more about the digital detectors? Yes, in fact the, de the detectors are analog but there is a digital processing of the analog signal. And uh, the advantage of doing that is that I can synchronize with the measurements and that will allow us to do um, measurements of peak and average at the same time, at the same instant of time, which 
give us the possibility of, in case of pulse signals, to do energy calculation and therefore protect the duty cycle not by measuring time but by measuring energy. At the same time allows us to do also the to create uh, a quality of service and measure for example uh, compression by just using the, the detectors that we have. In fact we have an RMS detector, an envelope detector and a digital peak detector. And uh, the, the processing of those signals uh, at uh, the same time, at, at synchronizing time, allow us to do most of the information we need. Tell us about uh, designing combiners for big power. Okay. Uh, in in power's architecture, okay, we based our high power transmitters in hot swapping. Okay, to do that, the combiner has to be able to accept a plug, the RF plugging to the combiner, so that uh, what's the advantage of this is to reduce uh, the losses. So. Uh, each element of the array of uh, amplifiers, okay, plug direct into a combiner without any cable. So we reduce a uh, uh, number of components and we make it uh, hot swappable. The other thing is that in, in high power combiner we need to be very careful not just with the power but with the voltages. Okay, so if you cannot have flash inside the, or arcing inside the combiner. So the design of it is extremely uh, delicate in terms of uh, uh, um, distances and gaps and the air and the dielectric that we use, all that has to be well uh, elaborated so that we can't uh, have um, uh, arcing or traces being burned and uh, also because we need to consider the maximum VSWR and uh, the VSWR can combine with the forward signal peak exactly in a fragile point of the combiner and that's why the combining is extremely important. In another Another point of this is that the combiner, the final combination should be always a magic T or a 3dB hybrid. And that's because that allows us to use the isolated load as an attenuator and therefore measure the imbalance between the amplifiers, the boosters. Can you tell us about balanced loads in the amplifier? Yes, this is an important issue. The, we use loads or attenuator depending on the condition. When we use a load, we would use, usually use uh, a sample of what voltage is developed in the isolated load. When you use the attenuator, we use the output of the attenuator to send it back to the system controller. The advantage of this is that I can see the imbalance, I can see how much, how e efficiently is the combiner, okay, because the less power I have in the isolated load or in the isolated attenuator, the more I'm sending to the antenna. And at the same time, it allows us to adjust phase and gain on multiple boosters so that we can minimize that, that uh, power loss in uh, an attenuator or the load. It's important to notice that in our case we use a full power capability which allows me to lose half of the system 
and still be on air because my isolated, the load of attenuate is capable of handling the, the unbalanced power. Let's cover the meaning of scalability. This architecture has three levels of scalability. At the rack level where multiple racks can be combined. At the 2U drawer level where additional amplifier drawers can be added up to 16 in the case of a six foot cabinet. And for pulse applications, longer pulse width and duty cycles can be implemented with a firmware change. Now scalability allows economical future upgrade paths to help future proof the amplifiers, but scalability of the architecture actually arises from the huge benefits to the design cycle in manufacturing. It's modular and repetitive, helping to standardize design and the manufacturing processes. One design covers many possible power and bandwidth combinations, important for developing a COTS product line which is difficult to do in what is a low volume, high feature mix industry. For example, when developing a new bandwidth configuration beyond what we currently have in the portfolio requires a new design of two different modules, a driver stage module and a second stage pallet. A new combiner design is also required usually. That's it. The software doesn't change and the manufacturing process is unchanged. I should mention there are some nuances to be aware of in each of the three scalable upgrade types. Case one, when adding a second chassis requires the addition of a very high power uh, two to one combiner. Uh, the second case I mentioned, with a less than fully populated chassis, adding to your amplifier drawers re requires no new design effort with a combiner as a notable exception. So if the uh, system was originally delivered with 12 amplifier drawers, for example, it came with a 12 to 1 final combiner. Now later upgrading to 16 drawers for adding nearly 25% more power requires a new 16 to 1 combiner. There's no practical way of designing a 16 to 1 combiner using only 12 inputs and terminating the four unused ports without significant loss of efficiency. Now case three, when adding longer uh, pulse width and duty cycles, you would trade off peak power to maintain average power. Here's an example of what we mean by big power. This S-band pulsed example represents a modeled and realistic configuration. It's 2.9 to 3.5 gigahertz, 310 kilowatt peak with 16% duty cycle, uh, pulse width from 20 microseconds to 1000 microseconds, four seven foot high chassis combined. Now you could arrive at this four cabinet configuration from any starting point and upgrading any or all of the combinations of the three upgrade paths. Can you tell us about the feature of adjustable gain and phase in the amplifier? Yes, it's very important to understand that in a case of, uh, of uh, an amplifier, a mult an array of boosters that has to be combined together that we, you, we have the capability of adjusting amplitude and phase. This, is, this comes from vector calculation, okay? If all the vectors are in the same direction with the same sense and the same amplitude, the summing of them is going to be maximized. So it's, it's a simple uh, mathematic problem and therefore we add to not only using cables that are uh, phase stable okay for temperature and for other conditions but also uh, and even the the format of the cable we also have an, a, a vector modulator inside each amplifier to optimize the, the power at the output. The next topics I'll cover are availability and the concept of effective MTBF. Availability is the period of time a transmitter is not out of service and on-air availability is maximized with a distributed architecture since it's intrinsically fault tolerant. You wouldn't characterize it as a redundant architecture. Now low mean time to repair increases availability but hot swapping maximizes availability. In this table it's showing the output power available 
for a 100 kilowatt 16 drawer transmitter for a given number of amplifier drawer failures. Keep in mind it's more likely for a drawer to only partially fail. The drawer will put out reduced power uh, but for illustrating the point, a more simple case, the entire drawer goes down. Let's say the driver or the power supply in that drawer fails. If an entire drawer goes down, the transmitter is capable of delivering about 94 kilowatts or 0.8 dB, 0.28 dB below fully rated power. Two drawers, 88 kilowatt, and so on. The benefit's clear for maximizing availability. If your application doesn't operate at full rated power, or your mission is still effective at 0.28 dBm below full rated power, there's no transmit interruption and a spare drawer can be hot swapped, bringing the system back to its full potential. But how do you fit availability into an MTBF framework? How do you turn availability from qualitative to quantitative measure? This is where the concept of effective MTBF comes in. The principle here is that the system can be repaired while it's running with all parallel units restored to working before one additional failure occurs resulting in fewer than Y operational parallel units. This is a statistical model that measures the probability of an additional failure to happen within the mean time to repair window. Mean time to repair is the significant variable for effective MTBF. As shown in the table are the relevant parameters for a 16 drawer rack system. We're looking at the case where the system performance meets requirements even if one amplifier drawer goes down. Uh, for a complete analysis you'd also consider the system controller reliability as it's a single point of failure as well as the cooling system. But this example illustrates the point. Looking at the table the MTBF here is an actual calculation for the 2U amplifier drawer using a mill standard 217F parts count method and came in at 20,400 hours, a bit over two years. You can convert that number to failure, uh, failures per million hours. That's a convenient way of comparing results. That's in the table. Looking, now looking at the top row with 16 drawers, you can see the combined MTBF of 1,275 hours, which is the result of an exceptionally high component count. It's a low number, and we usually think of an MTBF as a system failure, but in this architecture, it's highly unlikely a random component failure takes the system down. The mean time to repair column represents the time to replace a drawer a half an hour. And in the bottom row, we've defined a complete system failure when more than one drawer fails. The results of the modeling show effective MTBF is nearly 7 million hours. I won't go into the mathematics here, even if I could. Certainly the modeling is an expertise in itself. For example, this estimate used a linear failure rate distribution, but you could use an exponential or Weeble distribution. The exponential distribution considers a lower likelihood of component failure over time and I ran that simulation, it doubles the effective MTBF to 14 million. The Weeble distribution on top of that adds in the likelihood of early failures and if you do long burn in, you know, fair enough that that phenomenon is re reduced. You can actually find online calculators for the analysis as I did here, but a major defense contractor performed a similar analysis on this scenario based on decades of their experience in using their own proprietary modeling and the results are in the same ballpark. With this architecture well described and the effective MTBF understood, we can now take a close look at TCO, total cost of ownership. Value isn't written into a procurement spec. How much is performance worth when it exceeds the minimum requirements? The same can be asked with availability, ease of use, and ease of integration. Total cost of ownership, on the other hand, represents identifiable dollars spent. And in the case of TWT-based systems and traditional solid-state architectures, for that matter, there is potential for significant reductions in lifetime cost to own. I'll show you in a moment a graphical representation of TCO, but let's cover the major dimensions first. 
The initial amplifier cost is the first that gets our attention. The solid state PA is often higher in cost than TWT, although what gets left out of the headline is, in some cases, the cost associated with the TWT when it requires external high power filters, circulators, isolators, and arc protection. Uh, not to mention the associated insertion loss reducing output power. Additionally, some mission critical applications require a complete redundant system. Reliability is the next major cost over the lifetime ownership of the PA. Solid state has a clear demonstrated advantage here, but again, the architecture of solid state does matter in terms of extending its effective MTBF. Mean time to repair is not cost per se, but it is a driver of cost ownership. It directly affects equipment sparing quantities and a higher MTTR implies more specialized technician service training is required. The intangible of mission downtime is also directly related to MTTR. Maintenance costs don't apply to solid state PAs, but they do for TWT, Klystron, and Magnetrons. For example, cathode degradation is unavoidable and requires planned attention, rebuilding the tube, is about 40% of the amplifier price. That's, that's a realistic number. Major repairs are not uncommon in tube systems or solid state designs that are not modular. Oh, in either case, the power supply failure in, in, in the, with the TWT, the tube itself, are examples of common failures. <laughs> Annual electrical power costs in some cases is noteworthy and related to the differences in efficiency. Tube systems have an advantage here, although you have to put the power at the load in the denominator, not the power at the amplifier output connector. Equipment sparing can be a startling figure in some applications. It's last on the list here because a modular, hot swappable architecture has tremendous cost savings. This is a key takeaway, and you'll see its contribution on the next slide. I know of a critical FAA application using tubes that has 20% of systems in repair at all times. The number of transmitter spares required in this case are three times more than what would be needed for a traditional solid state design. And even better, now with a modular design, the concept of fractional sparing becomes a reality. Here is a representation of lifetime cost of ownership for TWT versus the scalable modular liquid cool solid state transmitter. Take a look at the assumptions made Put your own TWT or traditionally architectured solid state numbers in there. Based on your historical data, your use case matters. I chose an 11 year period for TCO and the example here could be a directed energy application, electronic warfare fixed site or ground mobile, or radar. For this exercise, the SSPA is priced at $1.6 million and the assumption is the two base transmitter is 60% of the solid state price. Other assumptions, the uh, solid state PA 2U drawer is replaced every three years and the TWT is rebuilt at year five and the TWT is replaced at year 10. Both the top and bottom charts use the same assumptions at the same time. The chart on top has initial cost is only the price of the transmitter and additional costs shown when the failures occur. By year 10, the tube solution lifetime cost is 30% more than the modular solid state cost. Now on the bottom chart, same cost, same assumptions as above, but the initial conditions is buying a spare system for both the TWT and the solid state. In the case of the solid state transmitter, a, a complete spare system is fractional. I mean, it just requires one 3U controller and two spare 2U amplifier drawers, where the TWT is buying a complete second system. In this case, the initial costs are nearly the same, and the increase in costs are replenishing the spare hardware over time when the failures occur. In this case, the tube solution costs 60% more than the solid state. On top of that, uh, on top of that cost savings are the intangibles. The scalable system never went off air. Uh, technician tra training is greatly simplified and safety is improved with no extreme high voltage power supplies to deal with. 
This concludes our look under the hood of a modern solid state amplifier architecture and let's wrap up highlighting the resulting features and benefits. It has lower total cost of ownership than non-modular architectures. It's always on air designed. It offers extreme effective MTBF. It's upgradable in power. It has enhanced pulse capabilities and fidelity. It's got waveform flexibility. Signal processing functions are on the roadmap and swap is better in many cases. Plus, features that ease integration. To learn more, send us an email to sales at empowerrf.com. I see green lights. All over the face.